Hello, Carl here with Sustainability Theory News. We're over at permaculturenews.org, the website for the Permaculture Research Institute. They have a very informative article, Permaculture Design in Five Steps. Now, the first step is the mainframe design. So understanding how water moves across your land, the access either through roadways or walkways, and the structures on the farm, tool sheds, homes, animal shelters, that sort of thing. So if you're lucky enough to have some elevation change, consider adding a key line pond or even just a small pond at the top of the property. Now, if you have that elevation change, every foot of drop equals 0.4 PSI of water pressure. So you can have some natural pressure Ised, uh, irrigation. Ideally, you will only need irrigation for the first year or two as you establish your permaculture farm, or maybe if you have a little annual vegetable garden, you could use it for that. Otherwise, you'll just have some natural seepage and leaching of water that goes downhill. Now, the uh, water, of course, will follow the path of least resistance. If you have very sandy soil, the water might not flow downhill, may just seep right into the ground. If you have a very clay-filled soil, you might have a hard time with water retention, so you might have to add some zigs and some zags to slow down the water, give it some time to allow the water to seep into the ground. Now, access. If you're going to be bringing in a lot of organic material to start with, you know, wood chips, straw, or hay, that sort of thing, you're going to want to have good roadway access. But, then again, depending on the soil type, heavy equipment can very fairly adversely compact the soil. So you want to make sure they stick to those roadways, whatever heavy equipment you have there. Um, and then again, sandy soil, it might not mess up the soil structure so much with heavy equipment, but still limit the uh, driving to limit the compaction structures. You want to have your house right in the middle of the farm and surrounding your house, which talks about the different zones, the different layers, are going to be the, the plants that require the most attention. You're going to want to have closest to the house. But first, sector analysis. Find out where your wet areas are. Find out where the shaded areas are, where you get the most sunlight, and uh, what plants will thrive under those conditions. Maybe you have a windbreak for the hot summer winds, but the cold northerly winter winds, you have no windbreak for that, so you might have to plant a windbreak. Find out how sun's going to move across the sky at varying times of the year. So it's important to analyze all these different variables and more when analyzing your site. And then zone planning. Zone zero is where your house is, where the people are. Zone one are where you're going to have your nursery crops for nursery trees, your annual vegetable crops, maybe even some orchard crops that require a lot of attention. Less intensively managed areas where are going to be uh, most of your other orchard species, you know, fruits and nuts and berries, that sort of thing. They still need regular monitoring and management some pruning perhaps but not as much as zone one zone three gonna be more passive area maybe you have some grain farming some corn uh, soybeans uh, of course hopefully organic maybe you have some sweet potatoes or some quinoa some amaranth that sort of thing where you only have to maintain it a couple of times a year maybe during harvesting or planting season Zone four, wild food gathering, wood cutting. It's going to be sort of your forest layer. You can kind of incorporate zone four and five into the same area. In fact, I would. And then put a perimeter garden around zone three. Some sort of herbs and spices and garlic and wormwood and plants that just repel a lot of pests. While giving them enough food and forage in zones four and five so they don't try to break into it. You know, that you don't want them to pressure your farm. That's what they call pest pressure. So if you can sort of have a trap area on the outskirts of your farming area to allow them to eat at that food rather than break into your farming zones, well, that could be beneficial. Now, there's a lot more in this article, and of course, I will link to this page in the description. And if you'd like to see more news headlines like this, subscribe to my channel. Have a great day.